I've been dragged. That was 23. Okay, here we are. Welcome to Dive in a World Building Mirror. We are still going. <laughs> we are still going to do this thing. You know how they say, just keep swimming? Just keep swimming. Just, just swim. keep YouTubing. <laughs> so, um, so my plan for today, and I, and I, and I, I gave it the name tracing the impact of a single object initially, but in fact, I confused Morgan into thinking that I was talking about individual objects like, like heirlooms, et cetera. And that's a cool idea for some other day, but it wasn't <laughs> what I had today uh, in mind today. Today I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about like pick a commodity or, 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 you know, pick something. We've talked about water before. We've talked about a number of different kinds of things. Um, but this is actually just kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting thing that you can do with your world to get deeper into it. And, um, and so, um, one of the things that happens in, in book two, Transgressions of Power, is that there is a startling amount of information and, and exploration on the topic of paper. <laughs> and, and, and like where it's produced and how, and, 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 and how dangerous it is, and who makes it their life, and who is threatened by it, and all these really sort of odd things that kept cropping up as I was writing the book. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of unexpected, but it did happen and I kind of went with it. <laughs> Hopefully my editor likes it, but, um, but it, it actually is kind of interesting, I find, um, because we have these sort of um, traces or, or you know, constellation, constellations of usage or, 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 or various types of patterns that we associate with particular things in our world. And if you're world building, they're not necessarily going to be the same. Uh, and that can have odd impacts <laughs> on, on the way that people's lives play out. Um, and we're, I guess, accustomed to looking at these differences, but not necessarily focusing on them specifically. Um, and we're used to sort of accepting a set of things as normal for a particular time period. I think that's more commonly the, the thought process that goes in. Well, you know, it's the medieval time period. What do I expect to see around? And, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't usually see it done object by object, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to say, okay, let's look at beer, <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. what, is the, what does the existence of beer imply? Agriculture. Yeah, it absolutely mm -hmm. does. It, apply, it, 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 yeah. it implies lar usually large scale agriculture, or, I mean, grain production, right? Or, or potato production, I suppose, if you're, if you're making vodka instead. <laughs> um, yeah. And somebody's got to be brewing it. And then the question is, well, how does it get sold? And all of that kind of stuff. How, so, how is it sold? How is it distributed? Is it made right. locally? Mm -hmm. um, if, if, you get, if you get a real... Uh, aficionado of beer and i know some like what kind of beer is it is it hoppy is it not hoppy how is it how what is the characteristics of the beer tell you about the culture itself and what they like and right what they value in their drink is it a strong beer for you to get smashed after work or is it something to drink because the local water is bad and you don't <laughs> want to drink the water so you got to drink weak beer all day yeah 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 you know, and, 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 and I don't know, but I love little moments in stories when it's suddenly drawn to my attention that this thing might not be normal. 
you know, like that that moment in the Lord of the Rings movies when when um, Pippin shows up at the table and goes, "This, my friends, is a pint." <laughs> it comes in pints. It comes exactly. in pints. That was such a great moment. That was Mary showing up at the table, and Pippin's the one who wants a pint. But like, but like, so it's a real opportunity, I think, to to pay attention to certain kinds of things and beer is not the only one obviously <laughs> right yeah. um i will point out in the book they drink pints the hobbits do uh, yeah so 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 it's something that was invented for the movie and it was great and it was <laughs> great but and you know what it was beautifully done and it was super consistent too right in mm -hmm. a way the idea that they would be overwhelmed by the concept of an entire pint of beer makes perfect sense right i mean right why didn't tolkien think of that <laughs> who knows because he yeah. didn't because he didn't have to actually create props for the hobbits <laughs> right, right? <laughs> like if you could imagine like pint-sized props for hobbits they'd be these huge gigantic well they, they were right so but at bilbo's mm -hmm. birthday party and stuff they weren't uh they weren't gigantic I mean, we oh. see, we, yeah, we 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 see, we we see human-sized barrels, but we don't see hu human-sized drinkware. Right, right. Mm. Well, and so you know, previously, before I think it was before Cliff and Kate arrived, <laughs> I was talking about how paper is a huge deal in my second book. <laughs> and it's like, sure. you know, what are you making the paper out of? Who is making the paper? You know, um, who is selling the paper? Why are they selling the paper? Is it used illegally? You know, <laughs> um, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. I mean, beer too. Is it is it used illegally? Very likely, right? Well, well yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the, going to the legal part. I mean, for a long while, a mimeograph machine was an illegal object in the Soviet Union. We weren't allowed to reproduce things. That was the state's job. Yeah. That's so interesting, right? <laughs> you can you do a lot of world building with that sort of thing about what's legal, what is not. You just think, oh, absolutely. You think that would be common. Like 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 paper. I mean, maybe it's forbidden to actually have paper. What does that mean? What what why would a society do that? That spins out a whole constellation of second of, of world building questions you can go just from that well and you know there might be particular historical events that led to it too you know yeah you can you can spell yeah, you can spell out history like why is why is paper now a restricted substance sure or you know for some odd reason you got me thinking about the giant molasses flood oh yes in boston <laughs> yes so when you have a when you have a, an event like the giant molasses flood that happened in Boston, what in the world impact does that have? Does it does it mean that we suddenly um, have laws about the size of containers in which one can contain molasses, for example? <laughs> or, or do we just not care and we figure that was a once in a lifetime or, thing? Or even like, well, why does Boston have so much molasses in the first place? Where, where does that molasses come from? What Why are you is guys it doing with all that molasses? Exactly. That, right? you, can get, you can ask a lot of questions just right out of that. I mean, it comes originally out of originally out of the originally out of the triangle triangle trade. So, mm -hmm. and that that leads to whole sorts of world building across your entire planet. Wait, Absolutely. did you say triangle trade? Triangle yes. trade, yes. Like they're selling triangles and not no. squares or trapezoids no. or no. triangular trade. Sorry. The trade of slaves and rum and sugar. Oh, okay. Thank you. I didn't. I had. I was Sorry. That term. I thought you were being. I thought you were being funny with me for saying triangle to triangular. No, no, no. I just never, <laughs> yeah. never heard that term in any of my history classes. So that's that's a new one. Yeah. So I mean, um, there's a Bermuda Triangle. I mean that that's a term. Uh, yeah, though that's you know okay. So let's try to keep on topic here. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so yes. single things. Did you ever yes. see the Star Trek episode, A Piece of the Action, where an entire civilization was based on one book? Yes, a book on Chicago gangsters. And yes, so published in 1990. Society. 
yeah so something like that yes yeah, so well it depends on how plausible you want to be but i mean this is star trek so there you go <laughs> oh that's mean <laughs> It's much more plausible than the planet of the English-speaking Romans. <laughs> <laughs> right? Welcome to Star Trek. <laughs> with, the, with the underground cult that, that worshiped the Son of God, yes. Very right, much. yes. Like, as, what? as explained to you by Jewish actors. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about something else then. Let's talk about pigs. Pigs. Oh, pigs. Yeah. You don't go from Jewish actors to pigs. I'm sorry. That's not good. No, no, no. We go from Jewish <laughs> actors to that. pork and from there to pigs. <laughs> but right? pigs are good for, for other things. Pork is, right. pork is something that we have distinct opinions on, right? Oh, yes. And if we wanted to track it through a society, we'd want to track where it was allowed and where it was discouraged and where it was avoided and, and how it was produced and various ways in which it was produced i mean my goodness if you look at the way the impact that pork is having or the the impact that COVID is having on pork mm -hmm. the meat right? packing plants here in the midwest yes then yeah. all of a sudden you start you start thinking about all the different ways that like oh we didn't think about necessarily where the pork was coming from you know or i don't know did you see babe anyone who saw the movie babe thinks about where the pork is coming from <laughs> or, or even before yeah age of covid the the problems of of waste of of manure and pig and pig farms and how that causes problems in local ecology when you have in north carolina and also here mm -hmm. in Minnesota and iowa and cause, causing all sorts of river pollution issues mm -hmm. but you can also look at at the the prevalence of pork and say okay the well, there's this there's this idea that, that bacon is universally loved. Right. Everybody Isn't loves bacon. Weird? And we have just erased observant members of two really, really big important religions. Uh, and that's just the two that actually all eat other meats. Yeah. It's the vegetarian religions. Yeah, 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 yeah plus all the vegetarians, yes. Yeah. So any any culture that <gasps> Where pork is a significant part of the um, the economy, you know. Look at look at that. Look at how other the, the people in that culture or visiting that culture are affected. Mm -hmm. How that the, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know how are those people viewed? If if you're saying everybody loves this thing, everybody <clears throat> must. Yeah, oh, I got you really know, tired of the bacon. That, that <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. so that in itself is another thing that we could talk about. Like, for example, that just we have these cultural narratives about particular things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are not necessarily representative of the reality of those particular things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And certainly not for everybody. I mean, there's hardly a thing that has the same Ooh. impact on everybody. Sure. I mean, that's actually one of the whole points of talking about this is that is that the impact that something has on people is wildly different depending on the people. Well, and, and, you, and you can, yeah, and you can, and you can, you can go very micro and work on one particular little thing, or you can go large. I mean, like, for example, why do Minnesotans eat lutefisk as an example. <laughs> that is something I've been wondering about. <laughs> and it, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a poor people's way of preserving fish. And so in relatively not well off Scandinavians come to Minnesota and they bring this tradition with them. In the meantime, back in Scandinavia, it's not easy to find lutefisk. Lutefisk only really exists here in the new world and even then it's dying out as economies and cultures and acculturation and Americanization has made it less and less appealing. So it's kind of like that sort of local delicacy as you were created out of a need for economics mm -hmm. has, 
has faded and you can you can dive into you can dive into migrations of migration economics acculturation assimilation just from having something like ludifisk in your world yeah is, is and there's it, is also dying out or what or is, is it right is it useful what does the old world think of it etc and and paul i also appreciate you bringing up the question of regional difference mm -hmm. because you can have you know uh you can have a t an entire town or an entire region that's dominated by a particular uh, manufacturer, right? Where where whatever they manufacture is the thing for this entire region, and it absolutely is is culturally dominant, right? And go, look at how that to, impacts people's lives. To, to right? go back to go back to pigs, spam is made in Austin, Minnesota. Austin, Minnesota is the span capital of the world, and they're proud of it. Right. Or it could be something like auto tires, right? Well, I'm having a, kind of an issue with my work in project, work in process, because we're at the point of sort of like we're, we're miming that if they're practicing, it's, it's drill, uh, but we're going to take over an enemy spaceship. Okay. We've got a whole group of different aliens, of diverse aliens who are doing this, and one of the conceits is that there's only one human in this entire area because he's the only guy who hitchhiked in. Um, and so they're at this point and they're starting to yell orders about who's going to do what. And one of the, um, the central tunnel is locked. And I was like, okay, they're going to go do something. And I was like, what color light is going to go on to show them they've succeeded? <laughs> because this isn't our Ooh. spectrum of, of, of seeing. It's, mm -hmm. It may not even be visible to us, and it might just be like all the rest of them can see into the infrared or, you know, whatever. And so most of the jobs that you would want him to be able to do are actually impossible because he doesn't have the, the, the physical faculties to actually appreciate it. Mm. Yep. Hey. Yeah, I still haven't solved it, but it's fun to think about. It is fun to think yeah. about. Well, and you know what? Whether whether your species can perceive X, Y, or Z has everything to do with what their technology looks like, and you it know everything to do with what your home world looks like because you evolved there. You know. Well, yeah. Are you a mantis shrimp and you can see seventeen, you know, extra colors? <laughs> I mean, that we have those here. So yeah, it's it's all about what assumptions you're willing to engage in. And, 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 you know, by proxy, make your reader engage in. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of actually a, a way of othering yourself, othering your culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you get a chance to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I think oh, that's sure. one of the fundamental core principles of science fiction and fantasy is, is to put distance between us and the kinds of human problems that we cope with. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, people in other circumstances, right? allows you to examine things from a distance. Um, uh, uh, Star Trek did that again with the original series. It examined racism by having characters who were white on one half and black on the other. And whether you were white or on the left and black on the right or white on the right and black on the left determined whether you were the under class or not, right? So they examined racism in a way that was separate from how Americans and in the 1960s. wildly reductive, but yeah. <laughs> well, and speaking of wildly really reductive, Enterprise did the same really thing. Really yeah. Uh, but I was going to say that, that uh, with sensory, visual senses, Werner Vinge and his Hugo winning A Deepness in the Sky uh, had this uh, sentient race of spider-like aliens that could see in a very wide, they had different eyes, different kinds of eyes, and they could see in a wide range of spectrum but they were in 20th century technology and producing computer monitors and it was very hard for them to produce a monitor that would display in the full range full spectrum that they could see and so they had various monitors that were very not monochromatic but like segments various segments of their visual ability and so this whole uh, kind of uh, uh, fortune telling came out called videomancy based on mappings of colors and things like that that was unique to a unique to spider physiology so sure. I like 
I like the way he started with the eyes and then had the technology and then had a cultural thing layered on top of the technology on top of the biological. Well, so cool. the, the whole point of the of the topic of the day is that if you start with an object, you can usually trace back to an environment and a culture and a, and quite a large number of diverse uh, entities that are engaged in interactions with this type of object, right? And so then the question is, what, what are those interactions? How do they play out? Um, and what are their impacts? And sometimes it's unknowable. Like, um, if you go to various archaeological sites, like Minoan sites, you see these things that the archaeologists call lustrial baths. And what is lustrial baths? It, it's archaeologists for this thing held water and we have no idea what it was for whatsoever at all. <laughs> right? Like they're archaeologists. So they say, well, we assume it's some ritual religious purpose. But they don't know. Maybe well, that's, that yeah. that's pretty when, often when building, code. Yeah. But when we're, we're building our worlds, we have to have some sense of what it is for. And you know, you might, you might end up and say, okay, well, this is what it's used for. This is where it came from. And if there's a disconnect between the way people use it now and the way they did when it was developed, um, then you have to know those things. But, you know, unless you're, you're writing about an archaeologist, you're probably not going to necessarily end up with people saying, well, we think this was used for something. We're talking about things that are, are used now, mostly, I would think. Here's I don't the, know. In, in, in my Pulse, view, there were the in my view, it's really a good idea to know how these things work because if you don't know how these things work, they're probably going to work either randomly or the way that they work as a default in your own culture. And that may or may not fit into the world that you're working with. I'm going to allow for the possibility that you can create an object and not know what it's for and use it for a while and then maybe in book two you the author figure it out what it was for all along that that's preferably before publication no yeah. <laughs> no that's you're you're a you're not a discovery writer juliet in that sense so yeah uh, but the, it, this is about the, the the work that has to go into a thing yeah you can stick something there in a book and not know what it's for but the minute it starts actually being useful to you you have to figure out what it's for absolutely yeah, yeah. so um, you know fine was, stick it in whenever you want the, that same work <laughs> has to be done i just mm -hmm. i just wanted to make a nod that it's that you don't always necessarily do all the world building in advance you it know what? Be it's ongoing, funny ongoing thing. because it's funny how many people assume that I do all my world building in advance. <laughs> well, I know you do a lot of your world building by conversations with your friends. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. But you know, actually, the thing that I most often do in conversation with my friends is figure out impact, right? Because I can have all of the world basic building blocks laid out a, a bit like the pieces of a pinball machine. But until I actually start chasing balls through it, I don't actually necessarily know where they're gonna land on the other side. That's a nice uh, metaphor. So that's where, that's where the conversations come in. Is like, sure. okay, here we have all of these, you know, all of these massive structures that, that I've created over a large period of time. But when we're going for this particular concept, con like context how exactly is it going to play out and that that's the part where you can really never tell until you get there so you know <laughs> sure so yeah it's, well that's the difference between world design and storytelling right like you can design a world without knowing how it's going to play out in a narrative but we're not writing role-playing game supplements. We're writing narratives. So, yeah, there. Well, that's a totally different topic. But yes, I mean, there are a lot of people who never get past the world building means creating my world bible, and that's all it means. Um, but storytelling is is an integral part of it, in my view. So, sure. But uh, with the, one of the things that's 
that you can do in science fiction and fantasy is you can have characters who are essentially archaeologists, right? You well, know, you like, can if you want to have an archaeology uh, plot. Yeah, so like you can have characters trying to figure out the meaning of something like uh, Fred Pohl's Gateway. There are the Heechee so-called prayer fans because mm -hmm. people discovered them and then marketed them as prayer fans, but it turns out they were digital storage devices. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and often ebooks, like literally, like a hologram of a book, um, and sometimes stored personalities. And so, uh, but it took like three books for humans to figure that out. Yep. Um, so that I thought was a really interesting thing. And then you have like, like one of the beauties of, of Tolkien's world building is he layers things on, he came up with the first age and the second age and then set it at the end of the third age. And so, like, you go to Weathertop, and it's the ruins from a previous structure, but it has meaning, you know. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that takes us... So, very often, these topics that we discuss interact with each other, right? Funny that. Uh, you know, because worlds are all interconnected, so... <laughs> so they should be. Um, but, yeah, there's there's the question of history, and, and hey, if you want to take... If you want to take history and combine it with the topic of the day, you can always say, well, you know, how, how was how was paper used back in in 200 years ago? And how how has that changed now with how has the production changed? How has, you know, accessibility changed and all that nice stuff? Well, um, also, you can play with people's spheres of expertise because there's that, you know, Facebook meme of archaeologists were looking at a you know bone piece of bone going well we don't know what it is or the you know default ritual object until they showed it to a leather worker and they were like oh that's a that's a scraper that that's what they are and they were like well don't we have these made out of modern materials and they're like no bone is the best thing to make it with and so it <laughs> hasn't changed and everyone else has changed around it but until you meet that one person who actually knows what that is you may be using it as a bookmark yeah that's true. Yeah. And that's actually a really good observation. I'm now, now my brain is going, oh, where can I do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you ignore local knowledge or knowledge of marginalized people, you can come up with radically wrong interpretations of things. Yeah. You, you don't... <laughs> the... the um, the example of the word Jehovah, which is a mispronunciation of the name of God, is a result of not asking the rabbis <laughs> something. So this is a whole topic, but it's like, it's, it's basically like, oh, you're marginalized. We're not even going to consult you, you know. Um, well, yeah, people like to walk in and decide what something means, don't they? Yeah, but it's it, it's like the, the leather working tools and and the um, and I think the same thing has happened with uh, with hair styling tools and, mm -hmm. and the like. Um, it's it's not just it it's the result of a group of people archaeologists only looking at the things in the past and not looking at and be, being focused on archaeology as being separate somehow from the world which is really kind of a ridiculous thing when archaeology is about studying the world just mm -hmm. of, of the world as it was in the past and if instead of doing that they look for connections between that or acknowledge the possibility of connections and, and um, connections and, and uh, are just gonna stick with connections between that and the the current time, mm -hmm. then they're less likely to, to miss that stuff. They'll be able to go and say, okay, this is where we find it. Look at the context. Does this, the context here resemble any current context? Because if all you're doing is looking at the past, you might miss something. You have missed something. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that, and you're not yeah, able to trace. Uh, hmm? Kate was saying something. Well, and I was going to say something about the directionality that we assume when we look at those scenarios. Um, I was looking at the um, article in Haaretz today of, of 
the uh, modern human tooth that was found like 5,000 years before we thought modern humans made it to Europe. So that means that we were living with Neanderthals for five millennia. Mm -hmm. And the quote journalist unquote says, well, we can be sure that modern humans were a great influence on Neanderthal culture. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah, no. Neanderthals did all the human things first. It, it, at best, it's 50-50, and it's probably the other way around. You know, and so, like, why would you come out with that as a definitive statement? Because as a hypothesis, it's not good, and it's not testable well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we have trouble contextualizing because we overlay our current sometimes too much on, on it and sometimes too little. And that balance is, is a difficult one to, um, to put together. Yeah. And also the meaning of, of artificial objects can change. Like when I was in Italy, um, I would see various locations, frescoes and other uh, paintings of little naked boys with, with white wings, right? Mm -hmm. And if the work of art was pre-Christian, it was a Cupid. And if the work of art was post-Christian, it was a cherub. And it, mm. But if, if you showed me a photograph of one, I wouldn't necessarily know whether it was a Cupid or a cherub because I'd have to know the date in order to, to draw meaning from the work of art. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, because yeah. then you've got then you've got peoples who come in and overlay their meanings on everybody else's meanings. Well, you know. yeah, like all, all the Irish states which were previously uh, pagan deities. So yeah, Bridget, Bridget becomes Bridget, St. Bridget and so forth. They, the Christian meaning gets overlaid on the original meaning and changes it. Yeah, syncretism is a hell of a drug. Yeah, and then, then you've got obviously like you know, Candomblé, Voudon, Voodoo, mm -hmm. Santeria, which is a Roman Catholic Yoruba mashup. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and so I wonder where we're going to be 150 years from now. And I still think that, um, who's the guy who wrote Coyote? Alan, not Alan Dean Potter. Alan, Alan Steele. Alan Steele. That guy had an idea. And boy, did he ever just run an absolute marathon with it. And it's so good to read. Hmm. But it's about God and, and what God is and what God can be and how it can function in our society in a more holistic way than the way that our religions do currently. Hmm. But also that moment of when humans, when humans who have monotheistic religions meet aliens and all of a sudden have to question whether we are made in the image of God, Mm. And they tend to mm. react poorly. <laughs> react poorly. <laughs> yes. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, a, poorly. there's a Paul Anderson story. I forgot the name of it often, where we meet aliens and we find out that aliens have proof of life after death. It's like, oh, the, the, these aliens must believe in God as well. And this is great news. And why are you keeping this from us? And it turns out the singer tale is, well, yes, we have life after death. You don't. Nice. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah and yeah. like, there's a bunch of different ways of, of looking at that. I, ah, I don't think it's Anderson, but it's some 1960s era um, fiction where um, the positive aliens have these two little sacks on either side of their spine up between the shoulder blades where they can't really reach mm. and basically it's a suicide pill and so they lose about 25 to 40 percent of their teenagers during the teenage years because it's so easy there's no way to keep them from committing suicide and so it makes you be better parents it makes you be better people to try and keep your kids alive and i ah, Hmm. The guy who, who wrote about the um, the the ravening metal uh, spaceships going through the universe. Oh, Kurt Saberhagen? No, but that, good plan. Um, he, he does do ravening metal. He does. Yeah, those are the um, the berserkers. 
Berserkers, yeah. thank you. Uh, but this is the other guy. But um, anyway, he's local to me, or he was before he died 20 years ago. Um, and I'll figure out his name later. But but it was just a really cool idea of, you know, what would it take to make your society better parents? Mm. Would it be this? Um, and there's the other one, which is another anthropological story where the, the guy is, um, people next door are, are, are lizards and they have clutches of, of children, eggs, mm -hmm. and they can't have them all. They can't raise them all. They can't afford that. So they eat them. And there's this whole long philosophical argument where he's arguing with the alien and, and talking back. And, and at the very end, I'll just spoil it. The, the guy's talking to his other neighbor and he goes, well, you know, after you had this long, you know, talk, you know, what, what did you do about this ethical dilemma? And he goes, well, I helped him eat his kids. So the alien won the argument. Hmm. So yeah, it's, there's, there's Yuck. some really cool stuff that, you know, it's a better riff on Nietzsche than Nietzsche. <laughs> All right. So I guess maybe we're done talking about particular items. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd like to actually kind of lurch the conversation. Further around. afield in here, but... so weapons, particular weapons, Ooh, make interesting items, right? Like mm -hmm. daggers, or whether you use, you know, like even something as simple as um, uh, certain religious restrictions against drawing blood, so you don't use edged weapons; you only use blunt weapons, right? Like that tell you about a culture um, or some, some things are restricted. For example, there are a ton of martial arts weapons um, that are say farming implements by Okinawan mm -hmm. farmers who were forbidden right. weapons, but doubling as weapons, right? That are not mm -hmm. objects. Um, so those objects tell you about the relationship of the various classes. Uh, and, Obviously, you know, in Japan, only samurai were allowed to have swords, right? Yeah, and the police weren't, but they had other things. <laughs> right, and so do your police carry guns in a more modern society, right? Or, or do I they have to have tell you now that the that the Japanese police in the era of the samurai carried jute, which What's are that? these were little poles. They're like little poles with with hooks, so that they're designed to catch a blade. Ah. Yeah, they're pretty cool. <laughs> but what's interesting is you have you have the you have the original item, and because its use is restricted, then you have another item that has to be possessed by another person who has to counteract it. And, and also the the Ronin were fascinating because some of them became monks, right, and started playing shakuhachi, which was roughly the same size as a katana. And I understand because they were trained in katanas, they could like whack you pretty good with a shakuhachi to defend themselves. Bandits. A musical instrument that doubled as a weapon. Well, you know, so I guess you could, I, I also have stuff going on with weapons in book two. <laughs> so that's got me thinking about things I just did, but like um, actually book one has, book one has the, who has what and what do you have in response question in it. And you guys might have noticed that because the Arisen are the only people who are allowed to carry the bolt weapons, which shoot sort of like laser bolts. Um, but the Mbati have to be able to protect their masters against those weapons. Mm -hmm. And so they have other things that they, that they carry that they are legally allowed to use in certain circumstances and it uh, i had a friend to actually help me think about what they would have to do and basically they have metal ball bearings of two different sizes um large ones that they can use to hit you in the eye or the temple and really peg you a good one or smaller ones they can use to you know put on the ground so that you fall over um, and both of those are designed specifically to be ranged weapons that are usable by people who are not allowed to carry the bolt weapons. And depending on how prepared you are and whether you're wearing a, uh, a bolt proof vest, <laughs> 
basically right. it's a thermal dispersion vest. Um, you will you will be able to handle an attack for with somebody who has a bolt weapon or not. And I yeah, I, and I appreciate it so in detail. I will not I will not name the author. He had a space opera world where people weren't allowed to have guns so that he could have swords running around. And I'm thinking, okay, so there's no guns, but people would still find ways to use ranged weapons of various kinds. Oh, yeah. why, why isn't somebody actually improvise anything? <laughs> Just running around hitting people with swords. Like, there's nobody's thought of anything to use as missiles? I, I mean, can't you just throw a sword? <laughs> if necessary, yeah. Hey, it's like, no one can hear you throw a sword. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Never throw your last sword at your enemy. Was, yeah. Was that Tim Powers? Because he did that in one of his early books. No, it was not Tim Powers. Because in one of his very early books, uh, The Stars Discrowned, was science fiction and not fantasy. And because uh, projectile weapons would punch a hole in a spaceship while all, everyone was running around with swords. Well, this was uh, that was basically just his excuse, world building excuse to get, was a means to the end, and the end was he wanted everyone running around with swords. Right, with swords, yeah, no, th but this okay. was also on planets, so it's like, yeah, oh no, 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 yeah, this so was they, it was just silly. It threw me out of the story. Um, but uh, yeah, Dune, right? There was a big deal that the personal shields yep. would stop fast attacks but not slow attacks and that Paul has to uh, when he's fighting a Fremen has to adjust his attack to be fast uh, and and go against a lifetime of training in order to survive mm -hmm. right that was a big that was a big yeah. part of that scene no personal shield well so that that makes me also think of a fight that I wrote recently <laughs> where um, where the person who's doing the fighting has a blade that's shorter than the one she's used to <laughs> Oh. Um, and there are reasons for that, because because yes. <laughs> certain people need to run through undergrowth and get it out of the way, and other people don't. Oh, right. You were talking about this offline before, about trying about to find a name for that. Forms of machetes. and <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Exactly. Well, even, um, even like in fantasy, like Harry Potter wands are a big deal, right? in that world as an object. Mm -hmm. A wand was extremely important and, and they're finely tuned individuals and you and know, have history. Have sort of yeah. agendas, right? And whether you're the actual owner of the wand or you're using somebody else's wand that is absolutely not yours, it makes a difference. And, you know, uh, so I, I thought it was like, I mean, she, she got a lot of mileage out of that. It wasn't just a prop, right? Yeah, absolutely. Whole, that was- The whole big thing. That was one of the things that I enjoyed about it. <laughs> it was it was excellent world building, right? And then she kept, you know, putting layer after layer of depth and hidden depths of the wand thing into the later books. And, yeah. And you go into Star Wars and you have lightsabers and yeah, you're right? working old people's lightsabers into new ones. Yeah. You reconstructed your father's saber. Oh, <laughs> there's just lots of world building in that one sentence. Yeah. And then of course the Lord of the Rings is about a ring, right? But you also have you also have shards of Narstil and this and that, right? I mean the Lord of the Rings opens with a poem about twenty rings that are the most important mm -hmm. things in, in the universe there, right? Yep. Three, seven, nine, and, and one. Yep. Yeah, that's actually tracing the, the impact of several very specific objects. <laughs> right. Yeah, and we actually haven't gotten into the whole very specific objects thing, which is what Morgan wanted to do. So maybe we should do that sometime. <laughs> yeah, we should, because we can go, I mean, tons and tons and tons of fantasy is all about that. There's always a quest for the thing. And uh, what was the last Marvel movie with the jewels in the glove thingy? That whole deal? Oh, yeah. The Avengers. <laughs> the Avengers. Avengers. I don't know, Marvel, DC, I don't know. You're, you're thinking game, Infinity War. Think. No, you're thinking of Infinity War. And yeah, it was Infinity kind of... War, yeah. yeah. Mm, so yeah, yeah there's, there's all of those. Um, and uh, you know, and of course, all of those. The, the many, Infinity many... Gauntlet, which was invented by Jim Starlin, comic you writer. You know what we need to do is we definitely need to talk about this because like the MacGuffin object, oh my gosh, yes. how many times has that ever been used? All of them. All the of Maltese them. Falcon. <laughs> the Maltese Falcon, exactly. 
since the multi's fucking before. Yeah. Right. Well, so yeah, it's Moby it's Dick is a giant they, they, swimming. They MacGuffin. sound like similar topics, but really, they're one of is one of them is sort of the hidden topic, and the other one is we should look at this because it's a thing that's done all the time and it doesn't get examined enough. <laughs> And also, mm -hmm. I mean, what happens too is that you have the plot MacGuffin, but the plot MacGuffin is often someone's personal MacGuffin. So it's like the chosen one has to go get the chosen sword before they can do the chosen thing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that works that way. And sometimes it's just your magical sword that talks to you in your head that you can't get rid of. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm <laughs> just, yeah. Okay, we're, we're close enough to the end that this is probably not a problem. It is on the other topic though of these these particular MacGuffins and their use in plots. I remember I really enjoyed the Bulgaria by David Eddings and then I picked up the second series and it, there was another thing that they were going for and I was like, no. <laughs> I put yeah. the second series down because I was like, I did the magic thing thing. <laughs> Can mm -hmm. we do that? Thing. not ooh, but there was another thing oh <laughs> too many things well yeah. i mean yeah <laughs> oh hey you know that is actually a story that's probably been written about the the too many magical things you know and and how exactly do we clean clean out this oh. store we inherited from um roger's the last niece forever oh, after which is set after they killed the big bad and they have all these magical things and having too many magical things around causes problems. So they got to disperse all the magical things. The librarians. Yes. Yeah. So well, that's yeah like, or, you know, and, and once upon a time, has a pawn shop that has every magical thing in it. Mm. Or the, um, the, the closing of all the gates in the book of Morgane by CJ Cherry. Right, there are these magical gates, and they're a problem. Yeah, because yeah, because time travel is bad. We must stop it. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> well, well uh, I must depart. I have another thing for the kids. All right. Have a good yep. evening. Yep. Thank you for having me. All yeah. right. Bye. So you guys all just got bigger. Leveled <laughs> <laughs> up. So I guess I mean it's we're we're on the end of the hour. Do you guys have any, have any further thoughts about this this um, object tracing exercise? I really think about it as an exercise. Honestly, I want to yeah. I want to say everybody who watches this video should go out and pick a random thing from their work in progress and and look at whether it holds up on, in the understory of the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can, it can lead to additional plot, world building, all sorts of things that you may not have thought of that you stop and try to, try to trace back down. It's like, oh, I can use this with that. It, yeah, no, it's a, you know, it's a fascinating exercise for people to try. And, I, and you know what? I, I don't think of these things as if you don't do this, it's a problem. There are instances in which it could be a problem, but more and more my view on this is, well, this is an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. If you start looking harder at this kind of stuff, maybe you can actually find something really cool that you never thought of that you could do, you know? I think it also builds capacity to foreshadow in the moment because if you put, if it's more than just a knife, it's a butter knife or whatever, it can, put, it can come up later in the story and be a pivotal moment. And you didn't have to work really any harder for that other than finding one more adjective. Yeah, right, yeah. Make sure that's not the one you cut. Cut all the rest. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, I went with blade. So oh. certain, mm -hmm. certain people carry knives and certain people carry blades. And I just described what the blade was like. <laughs> mm -hmm. But like, if you try to get too specific, then you yeah. end up being mm -hmm. very specific to our world and its history. And mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a problem. So yeah. And yes. <laughs> yes yeah. indeed. <laughs> well, I could I could oh go ahead. I could say more, but um, you know, it it's I think you pretty much we had the discussion last week, the week before. I think, I don't okay. know. Um, hmm? 
All right, well, you guys, I'm going to take us off the air. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks to everybody who's been watching. And we'll do this again next week.